good song. There's something else to hear the good song played by some wonderful musicians. Because time is going to go on 
whether you accomplish what you want to accomplish or not. Amen. So you get to the point where you really have to check your priorities. What's important? I don't know about some of y'all, but I find that as I do investigate to get older, everything ain't important, David. Yes, everything not important. You better say it. Some stuff can wait. Yes, sir. Not only can it wait, some stuff I can ignore. Amen. And I have to check and see that is it important to me or is it important to them? Sometimes I find out it ain't important to them either. That's right. And because the thing that we don't have control over is time, we have to be careful with that. Yeah. The scripture even said, teach us to number our days so we can apply them to wisdom. That's one of the reasons why as folk get older, some people say they get impatient. Not always impatient. They just know what's important and what's not. Amen. And they choose not to give that particular thing energy. One of the things that I tell people, I says, I would rather you waste my money than waste my time. Amen. I can get some more money. Okay? Blessed to be in the position where the first of every month, change, change, something in your account. I don't have to worry about that. However, my time is different. I can't get no more time. If I give you an hour and that's an hour wasted, then I can't get that so, 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 so let me make you aware of that up front so that when you say, well, 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 you know, well, Pastor Pastor, he didn't have time. You didn't lie. He don't. It's some stuff I don't have time for. It's something I'm not going to make time for. Because it's not important. Come on. So, don't just look at me, but you should have that same attitude to say, I'm going to check my priorities and see what's important. If it's not important, if it's not beneficial, don't put it on your list. Paul understood that with the church at Colossians. Paul knew that the people were facing many religious and philosophical options, none of which were neutral. There are situations in our lives, brothers and sisters, that you can't be neutral. It's a yes or no. Yeah. Amen. Okay? My wife was always telling me, you know, you just see black and white. You don't see gray. <laughs> well, and sometimes, I don't need to see gray. Because gray will, gray will get you in trouble. And so what I do, this is a confession, and when I see gray, I say, what is it? Is it more white or is it more black? And I deal with it on that level because I know I only got so much time. And with me being the age that I am now, it's really more true now than seven minutes. I don't know how much time I got left. So I can't be wasting the time that I have. So Paul is telling the church at Colossians, okay, that you got decisions you got to make. You have choices you have to make, but these choices are not neutral. You either have to say yes or you got to say no. You can't be in between. Okay? Notice that Paul in the scripture, he, he didn't say well, just add Jesus to what you already believe. Or he didn't say, well, factor Jesus into your philosophy. Or include Jesus in your ritual of what you're doing. Paul is saying, he's claiming that if Jesus is Lord, if he's Lord in your life, then Lordship does not allow that. It does not allow them to say, well, I'm going to put Jesus in where I can. And that's what so many of us do. We put Jesus in where we think he can fit in. And Jesus said, no, 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 you got it backwards. You get me and then put everything around me. 
Don't try to fit me into your schedule. I am your schedule. I'm the one that gives you life. I'm the one that gives you breath. I'm the one that gives you the use of your limbs. I'm the one that provides the house that you live in. I'm the one that provided that chain chain to hit your account every month. I am now a sidebar. I am the priority. You make time for me. So with Jesus being the creator, being the sustainer, being the redeemer of all creation, that all other teachings must give away. In other words, what the world tells you does not override what God says. It does not override what Jesus says. And that's why we've gotten into the, sh the shit that we're in now. Because we've made everything and everybody else a priority but Jesus. But Jesus. I'm going to read that version of the scripture that Jonathan read, but from a different translation. This is how it reads. So it comes down to this. Since you have been raised with the anointed one, the right hand, then stay focused on what's above, now earthly things, because your old life is dead and gone. Your new life is now hidden in mist into the anointed one who is God. On that day when the anointed one who is our very life is revealed, you will be revealed with him in glory. So look at this. So kill earthly impulses like loose sex, impure acts, unbridled sensuality, wicked thoughts, and greed, which is essentially idolatry. It's because of these that God's wrath is coming upon those who are dis, who are in disobedience or unbelievers. So avoid them at all costs. These are the same things that you once pursued and together you spawned a life of evil. But now make sure you shed each of these things. Such things as anger, rage, spite, slander, and abusive language. And don't go on lying on each other. For there's a fresh new you which is continually renewed in knowledge according to the image of the one who created you. Amen. In this recreation, there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian and conqueror, or slave and free, because the anointed, the anointed one is the whole and dwells in all of us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I want you to know that Paul here is speaking about the fullness of Christ. He's talking about the superiority of Christ, the supremacy of Christ, the sovereignty of Christ, and it's also on the reconciliation and, and the hope in the life of Christ. He has been issuing strong warnings against heresies. And I was listening to stuff that sounds good, but it's a lie. Amen. And that's what the world has done to us so well, it, it makes it sound good. But see, part of our problem is that we don't have the spiritual maturity to recognize that a lie is still a lie. A lie is a lie no matter who tells it. A lie is a lie no matter how good it sounds. And if you don't know the truth, then that lie can sound so good that it'll make you wonder, maybe it's not that bad. Now I want you to go back now to the Garden of Eden, because that's what that Eve in trouble. Eve heard God say that you shall you can eat of any tree in the garden but this one. He specified what not to eat. And what happened? Eve allowed Satan to come up and make her doubt what God said. Brothers and sisters, you need to know that that is Satan's goal. Satan may say, look, well, I can't get you to not do what God said. But if I can get you to doubt what God said, then you ain't going to do what he said anyway. So he works on our doubt. He works on our doubt. Okay? But now Paul turns to deal with the practical matters of how men and women who have been reconciled with God should live. 
And brothers and sisters, that's a mistake that we make. A lot of times we'll read scripture and we want to leave, we, the scripture we read, we want to leave it back in biblical times. But if you can't take the scripture from then and contemporize it into today, then that will do you any good to read it. Amen. Jesus is just as relevant today as he was when it was said back then. Amen. Amen. Paul tells the Colossian church that they need to focus on other things. We got people today who are focused on so many things that they don't have room for God. Mm. And what we do is that we rationalize it and we justify it and we think it's all right. We want to give God what's left over. The whole time God said, no, you give me what's right. Amen. And I'm not just talking about money. God is saying, you give me the same priority you give the world. Come on. When people go to the doctor, and your doctor appointment is 8.15, if that doctor don't see you until 9 o'clock, that ain't your fault. Because you were there at 8 o'clock, or you were there at 8.15. Nah. And you will complain to the doctor, I've been here 45 minutes waiting for you and I'm just getting to see you. But when it comes to God, then he's supposed to understand. I had to go see my mom now. I had to go do so and so such and such. God said, you're supposed to come see me first. You put them on hold. Don't put me on hold. Don't give to them before you give to me. Yeah. And again, I'm not talking about money. I said, don't give them your time before you give me my time. Because I don't know about you. Some folk will drain you. Some folk will weigh you out. You're going to spend some time with some folk, and when you leave them, all you want to do is go take a nap. <laughs> they will weigh you out. Now, you're too tired to pray. You're too tired to be in Bible study. You're too tired to be in Sunday school. It's amazing to me that we do Sunday school and then Bible study on Zoom and people still don't have time for God. You don't even have to leave your house. You don't even have to throw on clothes. You can turn off your video and just have your room and folks still don't have time for God. But the moment you get in a situation, oh Lord, have You're going to learn to determine what's right, what's wrong. A 
okay? But you see, as Christians, we no longer belong to this world because we supposedly have died to the world and raised and was raised in Christ. All right? I would I would get into the discussion with my with, with some of my Baptist colleagues and they would talk about baptism and talk about how the importance is of being baptized and you're immersed. Huh. If you're not immersed, then you weren't really baptized because Jesus was baptized by immersion. And when I say, you know what now? Biblically, that's true. Yeah. But you know what we've also found out theologically? That if your heart ain't right, you shouldn't go down a big and come on. Ain't nothing changed. Yeah. If your heart has not changed, you just baptized and you wet. Amen. But you still doing the same stuff you did before baptism. Amen. This is why we're so comfortable saying that you are not saved in baptism. It is your heart that has to be changed. Yeah. If your heart is changed, then you never get baptized. Don't you know you just the same as somebody who was baptized eight times? Yeah. You still saved. Right. Why do we say that? Because I don't see no place in Scripture where the thief that was on the cross turned to Jesus and said, Remember me. When you get into paradise. I don't see no way in scripture where the centurion said, okay, time off, time off, take the time off the cross. We're gonna take them over here, we're gonna baptize them, we're gonna drive them off, and then we're gonna put them back up on the cross. It didn't say that. He asked, remember me when you get into your kingdom. The reply was what? Today. He didn't say it the next worship service. He said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So it's not the baptism that saves you as much as it is the change of your heart. Paul is saying that thinking about the realm of Christ will affect how we live in this present world. In other words, when we check out priorities, we will find out that they will affect how we live in this world. They will tell us what's important and what's not. More important, they will tell other people what's important to us and what's not. The people know that, you know, uh, the uh, 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 folk know that I'm a pastor. Okay? So they know that there's certain stuff that they don't say around me. There's certain things they don't invite me to. And I let them know I ain't mad. Yeah, I take it personal. And thank you. Because I don't need to be there no way. Truth be told, you don't need to be there either. But that's something. <laughs> the Galatians were, should have been preparing themselves for the full re revelation of Christ's glory in which they were shared. These realities, these priorities are not visible because they're spiritual. But they are sure and they're long lasting. They will last right up until we get to heaven. Do you know that? One of the things that we say about, you know, it's so wonderful to work for Christ. Because the retirement benefits are out of this world. Amen. They most certainly are. They most certainly are. If you think your retirement is good here, wait till you call you home. If any of you have seen my, my Zoom backdrop, it's, a, it's a, some very elegant and some elaborate rooms. And they said, Pastor, is, is that what your library looks like? I said, that's what my library is going to look like in glory. Amen. Because see, up there ain't going to have no limitations. Up there ain't going to have no budget constraints. Up there ain't going to be no problem finding contractors. God's going to get, the scripture says that in my father's house are many mansions. I don't want no vacant mansion. I want my lavishly furnished. Nice. So I'm picking it out now so that when I get there, it's already ready. Amen. Paul tells them through his second recommendation that put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And Paul is indicating a strong recommendation and what preceded it. In other words, Paul is saying, since you guys have already died and have been raised in Christ, then it should not be impossible for you to kill off the, your earthly nature that is prompting you to do so. Look, none of us are perfect. We are still sinners. We're just sinners saved by grace. But what we're 
we're supposed to be doing is striving to be more like Christ Amen. than we are anybody else. Amen. So if it is not of the nature of Christ, then we need to work on not doing that. Okay? And he specifies what it is that we're not supposed to be doing. Okay? The Colossians were called to make a deliberate and intentional effort to once and for all rid themselves of what, be what belongs to the world. The actions and the thoughts. Okay, that they were to break from they were to break free from the tyranny of the flesh and the man that it puts on our lives and bodies. I am the first to admit that sometimes the devil will try to make you do stuff. Amen. I'm emphasizing the devil will try to right. make you do stuff. Come on. Because the devil can't do nothing that you don't give him permission to do. Amen. Come on. Do you hear me? Come on. You have to give him to you have to give him permission for you to act the fool. Because he can't override what God has done. Yeah. So that means that you got to give him permission. If you don't give him permission, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I'm telling you from first-hand experience, and I'm poor parents to say, I ain't telling you what somebody told me, I'm telling you what I know. Come on. I want you to know that there have been times, yeah. pastor or confession, yeah. that I wanted to cuss some people out. Yeah. <laughs> now, they think that because I'm a pastor, I can't cuss. Come on. You need to know I know those words. Amen. You need to know that I also know what sequence to put them in. Okay. And I can get a roll just like you can if you, you know if I wanted to. Come on. But what happens is that when that comes up to me, I tell the devil, you a lie, I'm a child of God, I can't talk like that. Amen. And God shuts that off and tells the devil, go oh, that set out and be quiet. Amen. And I say what God would have me to say. I got a pastor friend who I love dearly, and he'll tell you just the opposite. He'll cuss you out just like you cuss him out. And he'll say, look, you need to know I ain't been delivered from that yet. <laughs> well, I'm grateful that God has delivered me from that and some other stuff. But because I don't do it, don't mean I can't do it. And that should be the very same with you. So you shouldn't be so quick to tell somebody, like, well, that's just the way I am. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're telling me that you are choosing to disregard what God says and you follow your own thoughts. Why? Because God has given us through Jesus Christ the power to not act up if we don't want to. And you don't get to act up in Jesus' name. Don't be cussing me out and tell me in Jesus' name I love you. <laughs> oh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. That ain't gonna work. <laughs> the Holy Spirit said, you check your priorities. Who are you living for? Are you living for God or are you living for the world? Because see, the world don't know God. That's why they talk the way they do. But Paul is telling the church at Colossians, you know God. And you know that God has delivered you from this. Paul, to help you identify what he's talking about and what types of things he's talking about, he goes so far as to talk about what belongs to the early nature. Paul makes two lists, and each consists of five chains. The first list says, oh, starts out with the most obvious, the most scandalous, and then the sexual sins, the immorality, the impurity, the lust, and evil desires. But some, but it surprises us by ending with greed. You know, you got some folks who just greed. They greed. They hoard. And I'm not just talking about hoarding physical stuff, but you can always tell a physical hoarder. If you ever seen that show Hoarders, you know, you see people with rooms and newspapers, or, or a whole lot of cats, or a whole lot of something else. Well, you got some other folks that's greedy. Okay? They greedy of pride. They want to be right all the time. You don't know what you're talking about, but they know what they're talking about. You don't know nothing, but they know everything. Paul says, that's not a God. All right? And then he goes on and says that guilt is a subtle, I mean, greed is a subtle sin. In other words, it's one that sneaks up on you. 
If you ain't careful, you, it, it'll get you further than you want to go. When we tend to overlook, we rationalize, and we justify it. Paul emphasizes the obsessive love of material things, especially of money that is equivalent to idolatry. Well, some folks say, well, I can't get money, but I can get some other stuff. And a lot of the stuff they get us is maybe stuff that you can't see. Even in today's time, many sins are rooted in a desire for sex and for money. I spoke earlier in the prayer about why we have a problem with gun control. It's too much money. Too much money. The NRA has lobbyists that they get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars. That industry makes, that's a multi-billion dollar industry. Yeah. It's amazing to me that if you've ever gone to this, uh, uh, the uh, gun show that's over here on, just off the road. When they announced the gun show, the people are lined up to get into the gun show. The parking lot is packed. And you see people walking around the gun show like they walked around on January 6th. Yeah. And you have to, you know, you have to ask, why do you need those many guns? Mm -hmm. Don't you know that there is really no reason for a assault weapon in the civilian world? Nah. It don't take all that to kill somebody. <laughs> they got the, the AK-47 and the AR-15 and the ABC and the USE. <laughs> <laughs> and you just as dead. Yeah. And no matter what kind of laws they try to pass, they can still get guns. The second list that he talks about is a list of sins that focus on damage and human relations. It's a sin of anger, rage. Malice, slander, and filthy language. These sins involve the tongue. When we look at, you know, how many times have we heard it said, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words never hurt me. One of the biggest lies I've ever been told. People are right now in the shape they're in because of what they were told. The words that they were said to them. And in some cases, the words became louder. Then don't say anything when I ain't 25 years old. And they ain't not. You done told them for 25 years, they ain't gonna be nothing. So all they did was grow up and become nothing. However, you get the kids this age, and you tell them what they can be, you give them possibilities. And see if they don't become more than you thought they would be. Yeah. Because of that. Be careful of your words. Yes, and as children of God, we're supposed to be careful not only with our words to, eat, to, to other people, but particularly the words we say to each other. Amen. You don't cut nobody in this church with your words. You don't stop nobody from coming to church because of what you think. Who are you? Amen. This is not your church. Amen. This belongs to Jesus Christ. He paid for this church. He died for this church. He runs this church. And if you have a problem with it, then the door is it. You need to check your priorities and know who's God. And to recognize that you're not. Now, let me tell you, it is better for you to recognize you're not God than for you to wait until God tells you you ain't God. Because he'll tell you in such a way that you will be unequivocally convinced that you don't run nothing but your mouth. Come on. And if you ain't running that right, then you're going to learn the hush. As I close, as we work to rid ourselves of our earthly or our worldly nature, we like the Colossian Church will recover the image of the Creator in ourselves. Do you consider what other people see in you when they look at you? Sometimes I tell people, you know, the reason we can't get more people in church is because the people that's already in church. If you're not loving, if you're not comforting, if you're not nurturing, if you're not 
encourage them. Then you just really need to just either come and don't say nothing. Or if you're going to come, you need to watch what you talk. So let me say, is there anything good? Is there anything of, you know, pure? Is there anything of good report? Think on these things. Amen. You want to say something? Then say that. Because everybody in here ain't got issues. Amen. All of us are defective. All of us are broke. There's something wrong with all of us, particularly the brother talking. Y'all think I come to church because I'm pastor? I come to church because I need Jesus. Amen. I come to church because I need Jesus to work on some stuff in me. I come on Sunday because I've been fighting with the devil Monday through Saturday. I need to come and get that booster so I can deal with the devil next week. What image do you betray to others? Or are you more concerned with them seeing the image of you instead of seeing the image that God wants to put in you or on you? When we look at Genesis 1 26, we see that it said, God said, now let us create a new creation. Humanity. Made in our image, fashioned according to our likeness. And let us grant them authority over all the earth, the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and the, and the domesticated animals, and the small creeping creatures on earth. It says, where have my brothers and sisters distorted the image that God wanted for us? We're so busy trying to look good to everybody else that we're not looking good to the one who created us. Amen. And if you're going to please anybody, if you're going to imitate anybody, if you're going to be a personal impersonator of anybody, because you've seen people try to impersonate Michael Jackson and Elvis Presley and Prince and all these other folks, if you're going to impersonate anybody, you can impersonate Jesus. You strive to be like Jesus. Now, when they when they strive to impersonate all those people, you know the thing is they do is that they check their priorities. You know, the guy had to look at said, "Now, where am I going to get that? Get, get them silver socks? Where am I going to get that glove? Where, where am I going to get the jacket?" He, he planned all of that to get that. He planned to be at the place where the people would see him when he could get the biggest bang for his buck. He checked his priorities. We are to do the very same thing. We to check our priorities and see who's important. Who's important? If it's not important, then you need to not put it on your list. If any of you have been, been in management, you would go around and you would check people and say, let me see your to-do list for the day. And you look at the list and you say, you don't plan to do much in the day, do you? And the list would be full. But they would see what's important and what's not. If God was to check your to-do list, would he switch it around? Would he have to ask you, well, what's important? The critical thing about us checking our priorities is that when we are out of order, if we allow God, he will get in order. Yeah. I'm finding out that in being retired, I don't have as much time as I thought I would have. I have talked with other people who retired, and they said, you know, I didn't get this busy till I retired. Mm -hmm. But you know what I'm also finding out? That some things are not important. Mm -hmm. There's some things that can wait until tomorrow. There's some things that don't even make it on the list. But the thing that I make, or the one that I make sure is on the list, is God. Amen. When Paul and I was waiting, I told Paul, I said, you and I can hook up. If 
you don't mind if we get number two here? Paula said, number two. <laughs> two. <laughs> Who won't be more important than me? And when I told her God, and she said, okay, then I'm good. But if God, number one, I'm going to be a good number two. God will make sure you love me. Amen. God will make sure that you take care of me. God will make sure you provide for me what he wants me to have. So in the time we've been married, she ain't never had a problem being number two. She said, number two, people. <laughs> Benefits of being number two when he's number one. Amen. The beautiful thing in that is that that doesn't just apply to me and my life. It applies to you in your life. Amen. You make God number one in your life. And see if your priorities don't fall in place. See if your life doesn't become better because you've checked your priorities. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.
saved, we invite you to pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I'm a sinner. I need you in my life. I turn my life over to you and ask you to be my Savior. If you pray that with a sincere heart, that is what makes you saved. If anybody here, we extend to you the invitation. We want to make sure that when we walk out this door, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you're a child of God. Amen. That is our sole purpose. All the singing and preaching and clapping and whatever, that's good. But the real purpose is to get you saved. And I want you to know that we know we can't save you. All we can do is extend the invitation. Amen. It is the Holy Spirit that saves. So as a church of Jesus Christ, we have done what we were supposed to do. We gave you the word. We gave you the opportunity to receive the word. At this point, it's between you and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. As our acolyte comes and as we prepare to leave God's house, the devil of God's presence, we ask you to pray for, particularly for Miss uh, Kim Howard, our custodian. Uh, she had an accident uh, yesterday. Uh, she, I don't know how it happened, but she has a bad gash on her leg uh, down in the calf area. Uh, she had to go to the emergency room and get about 12, 15 stitches. Okay? So be in prayer for her. Uh, because with all that's going on, if nothing else, you know, there's infection and a whole lot of other stuff that can happen. And let's also pray for each other. Amen. Don't you know it's even okay for you to pray for somebody you don't know? Amen. Let's pray for those who do not know Jesus Christ in the part of their sins. Let's know those who have accepted Christ, but they may be struggling in their faith. We're going to pray for you. Because no matter how strong your faith is, don't mean you ain't struggling in your faith. One of the things that we want to be reminded of, God takes you to a new level. The devil won't get there. Amen. So we say new level, new devil. Amen. But the thing that we want to remember is that God is able. Amen. He promised that he would never leave us nor forsake us. Let us pray. Most gracious Almighty God, we thank you for these your people, O oh God, who have come to receive your word. God, is our prayer that something has been said, O oh God, to encourage your hearts, to lift their spirits. God, something to help them to check their priorities. God, give them the strength and the courage, oh God, to make the adjustments they need in their life so that you will be glorified and you will be edified. Father, as we prepare to leave this place and go to our various destinations, God, we pray that as we go out into the world, even though the sun is shining, God, it's still a dark world out there. Father, you have given us the power. You've given us the light, oh God. Help us, oh God, to share your light in a dark world. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, to present us faultless before his presence with exceedingly great joy. To the only wise God, our Father, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, henceforth now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.